Hi everybody, this is Dr. Julie Villar and we are getting ready for our very first virtual program at home together for the breast program. Now I see everyone coming in. So uh, I'll just give you a second to get settled, comfy on your couches with your computers and we'll go ahead and get started now. So again, everybody, thank you for joining us and welcome to our very first Banner MD Anderson at Home Together virtual webinar featuring our very own comprehensive breast program today. I am so pleased to serve as your moderator for today's session. I am Dr. Julie Villar and I am a breast surgical oncologist. I am also privileged to serve as the director of our comprehensive breast program here at Banner MD Anderson. Today we get this wonderful opportunity to hear firsthand from two of our program leaders, including Dr. Kelly Rosso, who leads our breast program in the Northwest Valley, and she's one of our breast surgeons, as well as Dr. Lita Mina, who is one of our breast medical oncologists. Dr. Mina also serves as the Associate Director for the Comprehensive Breast Program and leads our high-risk clinic. Our topics today will include cancer center milestones and program differentiators, as well as some new information about advances in breast cancer research and treatment. And I'm so excited, we have a surprise guest with us today, a very special patient to us, Ms. Jessica Walling. And just so you know, we also saved some time at the end for a special opportunity to have a question and answer session with our esteemed panel of breast cancer specialists. Uh, our specialists will include medical oncologist, Dr. Shaquila Bahadur, Dr. Emily Grade, who is a radiation oncologist, and Dr. Villar Loving, who is a breast radiologist and chief of our breast imaging section here at Banner MD Anderson. We really intend to cover a lot of ground over the next hour, so hold on tight. We're gonna move quickly. Today's session, just so you know, is being recorded, so the audience will be muted during today's presentation. But as I shared, there will be time at the end for questions and answers and an opportunity for you to engage with our physicians here. Um, so if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to use the chat icon at the bottom of your screen there to post your questions anytime they come up. Uh, any questions we don't get to will be included in a special FAQ section of a resource webpage that we will be sure to send out to you at the end of the program. So before I introduce our first speaker, I would like to just share some background information about Banner MD Anderson Cancer Center and our comprehensive breast program. Banner MD Anderson Cancer Center opened in the East Valley on the campus here in Gilbert in 2011. And this represented the most comprehensive extension of the University of Texas MD Anderson's Cancer Center with its patient-centered, uh, disease-specific and comprehensive coordinated treatment plans anywhere outside the area of Houston. Since then, the Cancer Center here on the East Campus has seen over 1 million patients and actually we see approximately 600 new patients every month. The majority of those patients are actually our breast patients. Today, Banner MD Anderson has expanded greatly. We now have clinics in the Northwest Valley, as well as a brand new three-story Banner MD Anderson clinic on the campus of Banner University Medical Center in downtown Phoenix. And although the majority of our audience today is from Arizona, I do want to mention that we also serve our breast patients with our Banner MD Anderson colleagues in Northern Colorado in Greeley and Loveland. So we are all over the place. Our mission of making cancer history is real and sincere and every member of our breast team shares in that mission. So we have created a program here within our comprehensive breast program that really centers on taking care of a patient at every step of their journey. And as a matter of fact, we start thinking about our patients even before cancer can ever start with a focus on prevention. We have an amazing high-risk clinic which brings together a team of oncologists, surgeons, radiologists, genetic counselors, and nutritionists to really identify and serve our patients who are considered high-risk for developing breast cancer. Um, we really make it easy to know your risk. So for example, a woman can come to our breast imaging center and have an assessment of her risk. If she is deemed to be high risk, she can get on the spot genetic testing. So it's really remarkable the services that we can now offer. Our diagnostic team 
is comprised of dedicated breast radiologists who all have specialty training in women's imaging. We do advanced imaging, including 3D mammograms, contrast enhanced mammograms, and breast MRIs. Uh, we also have a special program that you will hear more about today called the Undiagnosed Breast Clinic, which is a special clinic where patients can receive rapid assessment of any breast abnormality, including an abnormal mammogram or a concerning breast symptom, and get biopsies quickly if needed and careful follow-up of those results. And if cancer is detected, generally a patient can be plugged in to see a breast cancer specialist within 48 hours or sometimes even more quickly than that. And the treatment of breast cancer, as you hopefully know by now, has been revolutionized over the past 15 to 20 years. And our breast surgeons, medical oncologists, and radiation oncologists are truly at the forefront of bringing these advances to the patients that we serve. When treatment is complete, let's not forget about the broad range of services that we offer through our comprehensive breast program from patients who are living with breast cancer to those who are also in the full survivorship phase. We are really so privileged to have our nurse navigators, integrative oncology program, psychologists, palliative care, lymphedema therapy. I could go on and on about the services that we offer, uh, but all of these things are here for you to serve and cater to the unique circumstances for patients who are living with breast cancer or have uh, been treated for breast cancer. So with so much to offer, I think it's easy to see how our comprehensive breast program has seen approximately 15,000 clinic visits last year alone. So we, we do see a lot of patients here. So we are your team today and we are so excited and blessed to have this opportunity to interact with you. Um, and now I would like to take time to formally introduce our program where Hope Takes Flight. And we are so fortunate to have this esteemed panel of highly sought after physicians, surgeons, oncologists, uh, and medical educators to discuss the latest advances with you today. So the first speaker I would like to introduce uh, is Dr. Kelly Rosso. Dr. Rosso is a fellowship trained surgical oncologist who specializes in the advanced treatment of early stage breast cancer, as well as locally advanced breast cancers, including inflammatory breast cancer and male breast cancer as well. She also treats a broad range of benign breast conditions and provides breast cancer risk assessments, screening, prevention, and discussions on how to approach patients who are considered high risk if they are diagnosed with a genetic mutation. So Dr. Rasa holds a Master's of Science in Clinical Anatomy, and she completed her medical school at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. After that, she completed general surgery internship and residency at Henry Ford Health System and Wayne State University in Detroit. And she continued her clinical training at the University of Texas and the Anderson Cancer Center with a breast oncology fellowship. So I'm so delighted to have Dr. Rosso here and I'll hand it over to her right now. Great, thank you so much. I'm happy to be here, Dr. Bilar and everybody. Um, I wanted to illustrate first the patient's journey through our Banner MD Anderson Cancer Clinics. So one in eight women will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. And although most lumps and abnormal findings on mammogram are not cancer, none should be ignored. I wanna illustrate the two ways that a patient comes into the doorway and how we strive to provide seamless, integrated and expedited care to these patients. Cancer can be detected on a routine screening mammogram or manifest as a lump, swelling, nipple inversion, or skin retraction identified by either the patient or her doctor during a breast exam. With this in mind, and with the understanding that not all abnormalities are cancer, the patient can be seen and evaluated in our breast cancer clinic without a diagnosis of cancer. We'll go to the next slide. At the Banner MD Anderson Undiagnosed Breast Cancer Clinic, or UBC, Undiagnosed Breast Clinic, a patient can be seen and evaluated by a surgeon or an advanced practice provider. For example, if a patient feels a lump in her breast, she can schedule an appointment in the UBC where she can be evaluated, examined by a breast specialist, and undergo diagnostic imaging 
and a biopsy when appropriate. The UBC provider gives the patient or guides the patient every step of the way and communicates with them about the imaging results or biopsy results. If the patient is found to have a cancer, a consultation with the surgeon is scheduled. If the patient is found to have an abnormal uh, finding on imaging or suspicion of cancer by imaging uh, or an abnormal biopsy result, the patient can be contacted uh, or is contacted by our, uh, our other program coordinator, our BCAN program, and our breast cancer navigator uh, can contact the patient and arrange uh, their follow-up expeditiously. The, the navigator not only communicates with the patient, but also the primary care physician and assists with scheduling a consultation with a breast surgeon, typically the next day or within 48 hours. Breast cancer is very stressful and our aim is with these programs is to decrease the time from diagnosis to care. Our clinics offer integrated multidisciplinary care where our patients can meet with a surgeon, a medical oncologist, and a radiation oncologist and devise a comprehensive treatment plan. We discuss their disease in terms that anyone can understand, provide management options tailored to the patient, their preferences, and unique cancer biology. In addition, we offer plastic surgery, nurse navigation, genetics, survivorship, preoperative teaching by our surgical oncology nurses, and most patients who are candidates for upfront surgery leave their consultation with a surgery date scheduled. This is an aerial view of Del Webb, and it aims to highlight the proximity of care that the patient receives in their own backyard. With the imaging center located inside the Del Webb Hospital on the cancer clinic, located uh, building on the, the left, on your left, and with a, with a short walk across the street to the, the Banner MD Anderson Cancer Center. We really strive to offer streamlined, comprehensive, state-of-the-art care to all of the Banner MD Anderson Cancer Center sites throughout the Phoenix area. And I think I can speak for all of us when I say that we are honored to be a part of the journey. Thank you. I apologize, I forgot to unmute. So uh, thank you, Dr. Rosso. I really appreciate you taking us through that patient journey there. Um, I would say that you know one of the most rewarding things about being a surgical oncologist like you is taking a patient through that journey and seeing them overcome any struggles that they have with their new diagnosis. And I would say I've met many patients along the way who have taken this challenging diagnosis of breast cancer and turned it into something good as an opportunity maybe to pay it forward. Um, I know I've had patients who have come back to us as cancer center volunteers um, who have made care garments, for example, for patients who have had a mastectomy or patients who have made donations to our program through the Banner Health Foundation. The next patient I would like to introduce to you though, along with her husband, has done something really remarkable that has inspired not only me, but her entire care team. I'm so happy to introduce to you today, Jessica Walling, who has a great story to share and I think is someone who inspires me as well. Jessica, if you wanna take on, over. Thank you, Dr. Bollar. Um, hello everyone, my name is Jessica and I am so thankful to be invited here today to share my personal experience. Uh, last November, at the age of 36, I discovered a small, hard, pea-sized lump in my left breast while sitting on the couch and scratching what I thought was an innocent itch. Um, I was concerned, so I had an appointment the next day with a healthcare provider. I was assured I was really too young for it to be anything serious, but was sent for an ultrasound and a mammogram anyway. Afterward, the radiologist told me he believed the suspicious lump was probably a fibroadenoma, given the appearance, my age, and my family history. He said it was up to me if I wanted to go a step further and biopsy it, or if I just wanted to keep a close eye on it and for any signs of change. I scheduled a biopsy right away. 
Um, so on November 15th, I received a phone call that literally knocked the wind out of me. Uh, despite my age and lack of family history, I in fact had a very aggressive form of breast cancer called triple negative. This subtype accounts for 20, I'm sorry, 10 to 20% of all breast cancers and leaves few targeted treatment options besides chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation. I found an excellent medical oncologist who was able to see me right away, and I started my first round of chemotherapy within 12 days. I'm so grateful to that medical oncologist for both his compassion and the urgency he showed in getting me treatment initiated so quickly. Unfortunately, I was also overwhelmed with the fragmented nature of the care at his center. Chemotherapy infusions were in one location. Labs were drawn the day before chemo at another location. Diagnostic imaging was done elsewhere through a separate company, and my prescriptions were sent to a community pharmacy. On top of that, I was eager to explore other supportive care options due to, uh, on top of my conventional treatment, but I felt discouraged thinking about having to juggle so many appointments all over town. Mm -hmm. A physician friend who is affiliated with Banner in Colorado suggested we check out Banner MD Anderson Cancer Center, specifically because of the robust clinical trial pipeline should my treatment path have to lead there. I remember being worried at the thought of having to change my cancer care location, but I made an appointment anyway because my family urged me to at least hear another opinion. On my initial visit, I was greeted by a compassionate volunteer who guided me through the registration process and gave me a complete tour of the facility. I quickly realized that everything I needed for treatment and also what I was seeking in supportive care resources were all available in one location. In one visit, I was able to have my labs drawn, visit my medical oncologist, do a chemotherapy infusion, and pick up my prescriptions all in the same building. Thankfully, my breast surgeon, Dr. Byram, was able to squeeze me in on that appointment right away. She was calm and confident in her assessment of my situation, and she helped me understand that Banner MD Anderson provides care based on the same protocols and standards provided at MD Anderson in Houston, who is a national thought leader or national leader in breast cancer care. She told me that my care would be reviewed by a team of cancer experts and that she even travels to Houston to collaborate with other breast cancer clinicians. For the first time since my diagnosis, it felt like I had gained a little sense of security back and I had a plan for moving forward that I felt comfortable with. I transferred my care to Banner MD Anderson that day and today I am so proud that I had the courage to do so. During my first appointment with my medical oncologist, Dr. Bahador, she informed me of a new option available at the clinic for hair preservation called scalp cooling. I explained to her that I was sadly already anticipating the loss of my hair due to already completing one chemotherapy session without the use of scalp cooling. She informed me that although I may still lose my hair from the first chemo session, the scalp cooling technology they had could possibly help my hair grow back faster. Although I did lose most of my hair as expected because of the type of chemo that I needed, my hair at the completion of my 16 rounds was already an inch long. So another supportive care benefit I had the opportunity to experience was free acupuncture treatments during chemotherapy. I found it beneficial in managing side effects like fatigue and anxiety, and so I scheduled additional one-on-one -on -one appointments at the oncology integration clinic. In addition to acupuncture treatments, I was also able to schedule oncology massages, nutrition guidance, and psychology appointments. As a cancer patient, I wasn't able to just freely get any kind of massage or expect a nutritionist to know about my specific dietary needs and treatment goals. So I believe having professionals on site who were also educated in the complexities of cancer was invaluable to my healing and my mental health. When COVID-19 hit and the hospital was closed to visitors for the safety of the patients, the staff and nurses took over many of the duties my family was previously assisting me with. I was on my own, so they would assist me with uh, changing out my gloves and frozen booties during chemo to pre prevent neuropathy, um, help me carry my belongings to and from appointments, and even recorded me ringing the celebratory bell after chemo and radiation so my family could watch. Prior to COVID-19, radiation patients could participate in a personalized 3D video of how radiation treatment is performed. 
noticing that I was very anxious about starting radiation, a patient care coordinator named Tina went above and beyond to ease my mind by setting up one of these 3D experiences for me, even though the classes weren't running as scheduled. In addition to that, at the tail end of my radiation treatments, I actually felt ill and I quickly got tested for COVID-19 and self-quarantined. Doing so had me panicked um, at the delay of daily radiation treatments, which I thought might negatively affect my prognosis. Knowing this, my radiation oncologist, Dr. Grade, picked up the phone during, I'm sure, what was a busy day and called me at home to walk me through the data specific to my situation and help calm my concerns. That same, the same day I got my COVID-19 negative test back, the radiation team even stayed later and squeezed me in as the last patient of the day. Prior to my cancer diagnosis, my husband and a friend had begun to start a nonprofit charity called Be Kind Project. They wanted to raise funds to support acts of kindness for others. And over the course of my treatment, we heard many stories of the financial hardship breast cancer patients were experiencing on top of the stress of going through cancer. My husband and I felt inspired to do something to help breast cancer patients who would come through the door after me to fight the battle of their lives and wanted to do it with an institution we believed in. Through Be Kind Project, we're pledging to raise and donate $1.25 million to establish a Be Kind Project Banner MD Anderson Breast Cancer Patient Assistance Fund. The fund will be a donation and endowment to help breast cancer patients in need of financial assistance with supportive care expenses not covered by insurance. This could include things like diagnostic MRIs, clinical trials, genetic counseling, hair preservation, and psychological counseling. Later, there will be a link on the resource page for this virtual program that provides more information about the Be Kind Project if you're interested in learning more or would like to make a donation to the fund. For me, what sets Spanner MD Anderson apart is not just the obvious cutting edge medical treatment options and physicians who are truly top notch clinical experts in treating cancer. It's also the numerous integration therapy options, the lifestyle education, the heartfelt compassion you feel from the staff and volunteers striving to improve the cancer journey. Thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity to tell my story and also for this virtual platform to express my deepest gratitude to the physicians, nurses, staff, volunteers at Banner MD Anderson for everything that they did to save my life and the steps they continue to take to make cancer history. So thank you and I'll turn it back over to Dr. Villar. Thank you so much, Jessica, for taking the time to come join us today and for sharing your remarkable story. I know that this experience can be scary as you elaborated so well from a perspective that you know we as physicians don't experience because we're on the other side, but it's always so amazing and inspiring to hear it straight from your words. Um, it's great to hear what you're putting together for other patients both now and in the future, and we're so excited for your partnership with us. Um, so everybody, as Jessica mentioned, there will be a resource page that will be sent to you at the end of this program, and it will include links to the Be Kind project, as well as a recording of this program and other information that we will discuss today. So be sure to look out for that. Um, I just wanted to take a, time, um, a little bit of time to express how meaningful it is to us to have patients like Jessica participate in philanthropy. Uh, philanthropy is so instrumental to what we do here at Banner Health as we are a nonprofit organization that invests all of our proceeds back into delivering services and programs for patients who need assistance for breast cancer resources, research, and programs. So without philanthropy, we wouldn't be able to do what we are doing even right now. Uh, you know, I like this photo here. I, I often like to look up in the sky and see the birds up there. And I have to say, you don't need to be a bird enthusiast to at some point in time have seen this fascinating bee formation that's up in the air with birds who migrate. Um, and a lot of science has actually been learned about this bee formation in the most recent years. And what scientists have actually discovered when you look at this formation of birds is that birds really can travel and fly further when they work together. 
you see the birds in the back actually get a little bit of an uplift from the wake of the bird in front of them. And by working together, one study theorized that, for example, 25 birds flying in V formation can travel 70% further. So a 70% greater range just by working together. When birds migrate, they often migrate anywhere between three to eight hours in one travel journey. So imagine what a boost that can be. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's all fine and dandy for the bird in the back, but what about the bird in the front who's doing all the work? Imagine the burden that that bird must carry leading the pack and paving the way for everybody else. But what scientists actually learned was that when these birds migrate like this, they actually take turns taking the lead at the front of the V. They all work together and collaborate. And so they almost know that if each one contributes a little bit, they will all fly further together. So really that same extension of power can be um, extended to our cancer center and the way that we are all uplifted and can do so much more for all the little pieces of resources or time or help or donations that our patients give back to us. Every donation makes a positive impact to our patients, which then extends to their families, which then extends to our communities. So we truly can fly further when we work together. So I just wanted to take a moment now to highlight how much we do appreciate your support of our breast cancer patients, programs and research, and just say thank you to the Banner Health Foundation and all who have donated to this program to advance the science and make this treatment and care possible for our patients. Please know how thankful we are as your physicians and as your clinical team. So before I introduce our next speaker, I just wanted to put in a quick plug for an easy way to lend your support to our program over the next month, as October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. During the entire month of October, pink label water bottles will be available at all bashes and food city stores in Maricopa County. And a percentage of the sales will come right back to benefit Banner MD Anderson Cancer Center and our comprehensive breast program. Uh, Bashes will also be promoting ways to donate at the register to our breast cancer research program as well during checkout. So uh, look out for that too. One of our very own Banner MD Anderson patients, Tracy Beagley, will be the spokesperson for this program this year. And you can see there, you'll see her smiling face on all the promotions in the stores. So uh, thank you for giving me that opportunity to, to discuss that with you. And I promise with no further ado, I am going to introduce our next special speaker to you, uh, Dr. Alita Mina. And after Dr. Mina speaks, we will have time for our Q&A session as well. So Dr. Mina is a medical oncologist and she specializes in both breast cancer treatment and prevention. She serves as the Associate Director of the Comprehensive Breast Program and also the head of the High Risk Program here at Banner MD Anderson. Dr. Mina attended medical school at the American University in Beirut in Lebanon. And after doing her internship there, she completed her residency at Indiana University in Indianapolis and she did her postgraduate training in a combined fellowship of hematology and oncology at Indiana University's Melvin and Bren Simon Cancer Center. We are so lucky and fortunate to have Dr. Mina joining us today, and I'm going to hand it over to her now. Hi, everyone. It is really my pleasure to join you uh, this evening and talk to you about my passion, which is actually research in breast cancer. Um, in the past, chemotherapy was actually the only option for our breast cancer patients. But recently, we have learned that breast cancer is actually not only one disease. It's made of several subtypes of diseases. And we learned that for each subtype, we need to design an individualized type of treatment. We are now finally at the forefront of the latest treatments where we are trying to combine targeted therapy, look into more ways of using immunotherapy, and most important, using clinical research to help advance uh, treatment for breast cancer. Next. So our clinical uh, research is trying basically to bring to Arizona the latest science, as well as the cure for our breast cancer patients. 
I feel we are very lucky because we are in collaboration with two giants in the field, both ASU here locally, as well as the University of Texas MD Anderson in Houston. And with both those two giants, we are able to bring to our breast cancer patients the latest that we have in breast cancer research. Next, please. In the essence of time, I'm not gonna go over all of our clinical trials. As my colleagues know, once I get started, I keep on going. So I'm gonna focus on just a couple of clinical trials that we are really proud of. One of them is the breast cancer genetic testing research study that we're doing with MD Anderson Houston. And the second one is the exceptional responder studies of trying to eliminate surgery in breast cancer patients. Next, please. So the first study that's really dear to, our, to my heart is the breast cancer genetic testing research. This is a study that's done in partnership with MD Anderson Houston and that aims to offer all of our breast cancer patients the ability and the option to learn more about their genes. I think knowing your genetic profile, having your genetic testing results can benefit not only the patient themselves, but also all of their loved ones and can help them make decisions for themselves as well as their family if they choose to do so. Next, please. The other study that we are also very proud to have is the Exceptional Responders Study. We have really come a long way. Not too long ago, I mean, we're talking decades ago, we used to have to do huge major uh, surgeries for all of our breast cancer patients. And now we're trying to imagine a world where possibly early breast cancer will not need to have a surgery. The aim of this study is to try and eliminate surgery after giving a patient systemic therapy while treating HER2 positive or triple negative breast cancer. This trial can ultimately allow a patient to get her systemic treatment and hopefully avoid having to go through any surgical procedure, potentially saving her breast as well as the body image without compromising her life. Next, please. And um, finally, um, I want to uh, take this opportunity to talk about a recent uh, really great grant that we were able to secure for our breast cancer patients. So we've worked with Philanthropy and Pfizer to be able to come up with a grant that will help our breast cancer patients that have actually metastatic disease. This type of clinic is called the mobile clinic, and it's aimed to go and help our metastatic breast cancer patients with home nursing visits as well as assessments in their own homes. Next. This mobile clinic aims to improve the quality of life of our patients. It's gonna try and help them be compliant with their medications by checking on them in their own homes and going over their list of medications as well as trying to avoid for them to come and have unnecessary visits to the doctor or the emergency room. The ultimate goal of this clinic is actually making care more accessible and easier for patients who are dealing already with something that's life-threatening and stressful in their daily life. Next. Our vision as the breast team at Banner MD Anderson is actually to develop all of the research trials that target not only uh, an estrogen positive breast cancer, not only a HER2 positive, but also all subtypes of breast cancer in all their intricacies and all of their difficulties. Our goal is to try and have a clinical trial for each patient if they choose to do so, so that they have the option not only to get in standard treatment, but having the option of maybe trying something new that could be potentially life-saving. Thank you. Next. Thank so you. with that, I'll take it back to Dr. Bilar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mina, for sharing some of the highlights of our breast cancer research program at Banner MD Anderson. 
I know we have a huge portfolio and you are so active in the research realm that we don't have time to go over all of them. So thank you for sharing two of those highlights that I think really do illustrate things that we offer at Banner MD Anderson that really are not available anywhere else in the Valley. So we're so, so proud of that. Um, so thank you everybody for participating with our first ever virtual program. Uh, this is something special for all of us and special for all of you, I'm sure, with these special times of COVID. But we hope you have found this information both informative and interesting. And just a final reminder, there will be a recording of this program on the resource webpage that you will receive a link for after this program. Um, so look for that follow-up email. Uh, when you finish this program today. So now we will use the remaining time to address uh, any of the questions that have come in during this program. And again, you will have an opportunity to ask our esteemed panel of physicians any questions you have in mind. So I'm going to, so everyone's up here now, you can see, and any panelists feel free to chime in, but I'm gonna actually start with one of the questions that um, somebody sent in. Uh, with their RSVP. So they shared, what are the odds that cancer will come to both breasts? I had it come to one side twice, and now I need to decide whether to remove one or both breasts. So um, maybe Dr. Rosso, would you like to address this? Absolutely. Um, all right. Just making sure I'm not on mute. Perfect. Um, thank you for the question. This is um, not an uncommon question, although it is uncommon to have a second breast cancer if you're average risk. But there are many risk factors or many factors that increase your risk of developing a second or even a third breast cancer, including age, strong family history of breast cancer, or the presence of a gene mutation, such as a BRCA or BRCA gene mutation. So when we talk about offering a patient a risk-reducing mastectomy, or uh, meaning removing the breast without the cancer to reduce the risk of breast cancer in that breast in the future, we discuss the patient's individual risk. And it is offered for patients who desire symmetry, who have extreme anxiety about a recurrence, or who have uh, characteristics that make them at increased risk of a second or even a third breast cancer. So I would implore you to discuss your risk with your doctor and your surgeon and um, consider genetic testing if you haven't done so already um, because an average risk woman her risk of developing a second breast cancer is actually very low. So we don't often um, jump to bilateral mastectomies for every patient with breast cancer who comes through, through the door. Um, another important thing to keep in mind is that um, removing a healthy breast or a healthy part of the body doesn't necessarily improve your overall survival from breast cancer, but of course it can help decrease the risk of developing a breast cancer in that breast. breast. And it's um, at the end of the day just important to know what that risk is for you, your individual risk. Dr. Rosso, I would totally echo that as well as another, I'm a surgical oncologist as well, and we, we frequently get that question. So I would um, completely echo everything that you said. Um, we have a couple questions about the presentation um, to Dr. Mina. Um, so that is great to hear about your genetic testing study, which offers genetic testing to everyone with breast cancer. I don't have breast cancer, but I'm interested in testing. What should I do? Uh, I think, uh, I mean, this is a great question, and I think it goes again to the question about like the risk assessment. The easy way to answer that is to basically ask yourself, do you have any risk factors for breast cancer, like any significant family history, somebody in your family with a lot of cancers, or and if that's the case, ideally, you want to uh, contact us and be hooked up with a high-risk clinic. On the other hand, if you feel like there is no family history, but I'm still curious about, like, do I have a genetic uh, predisposition? 
Um, that's a little bit harder to kind of, you know, assess as far as like the high risk, but it is something that's also easily doable. Uh, we will um, be like, we would offer for you to contact our genetic counselors. They would meet with you, take a full family history, full risk assessment and offer genetic uh, testing. And based on your risk assessment, they will see if they are able to kind of, you know, have that uh, built to the insurance versus not, again, based on the risk uh, assessment profile. Thank you. And we'll make sure to put some information on how to access our genetic counseling program here at Banner MD Anderson in that resource page. Um, as Dr. Amina mentioned, there's a lot that goes into uh, figuring out who needs genetic testing. But um, as a, a surgeon, I would say even when patients come back with uh, normal genetic results, if they're deemed high risk, you know, Dr. Amina's high risk program is another opportunity for patients to come in and get assessed and have their needs addressed as well. So um, we can put information on that on our resource webpage as well. Um, so also with regards to the presentation, the, the other study that Dr. Mina mentioned, the exceptional responder trial, um, a, a audience member wrote, I see that the exceptional responder trial includes triple negative patients. Are there any other new treatments for triple negative cancers? Um, Maybe Dr. Bahadur, would you like to address that? Sure. Um, so in regard to specific to triple negative, we have, um, there has been um, recent advances. Uh, we had in the last uh, year, three drugs approved for metastatic triple negative breast cancer. Um, but we don't have any recent changes into early stage. However, that being said, we do have active clinical trials that are evaluating patient who has triple negative um, disease, early stage one, two, and three. And um, so if we can do more targeted therapies, um, we were part of a clinical trial, the Olympia trial, which specifically evaluated the OLAPRAP and they have uh, completed their recruitment. We're awaiting the results of the study. Um, it was specifically mostly triple negative BRC1 and 2 positive patients. They did include some BRC negative and triple negative. So we're waiting for the results of that. That's for early stage triple negative breast cancer. We are also right now actively uh, recruiting patients in triple negative who um, receive new adjuvant chemotherapy. And if they have residual disease after the, they complete their chemotherapy and surgery, we see there is more disease in the breast or in the lymph node, then they get randomized to immunotherapy. Um, so then they may receive that. So that's an active clinical trial going. As far as this recent FDA approval or changes in early stage, no, but there are uh, studies going on um, to evaluate and uh, hopefully we'll have a drug coming up soon. Uh, but there have been significant improvement and there are multiple clinical trials right now that we have for triple negative breast cancer. Thank you, Dr. Bahadur. So just to clarify for patients, are some of these new treatments even oral medications? Um, the Olaparap was oral. Um, it is oral drug, which has been approved in metastatic triple negative breast cancer with BRCA positive. Um, and that is a pill that they take for one year. Um, again, that study is completed. We're waiting for the results of that. As far as for the um, immunotherapy, right now they're um, IV infusion every three weeks. We do use uh, uh, capecitabine, which is a chemotherapy pill. Um, it is based on the retrospective studies. Um, and that is um, also shows some improvement, improved survival in patient with triple negative. So we have been using that in the last two, three years, patient with residual disease, they received capecitabine for six months to a year. Uh, that's been kind of standard care that we do, but this is now we're looking more of a targeted treatments uh, um, and uh, we're looking, evaluating that. There was a recent, in April, a drug, uh, uh, monoclonal antibody in co conjugate with chemotherapy was approved in metastatic um, breast cancer, uh, triple negative, and they've been they starting to evaluate that in um, adjuvant or new post new adjuvant treatments. So there are in clinical trials, but uh, there's a lot of research is going on. So hopefully we'll have more to come. Sounds like there's a lot of research going on. Um, 
I know that patients always ask, is, is my chemo oral? Is it my chemo IV? It sounds like a lot of research is happening right now, investigating all avenues. So that's super exciting. Um, we have another question um, kind of along those lines because triple negative is a unique cancer, a question about inflammatory breast cancer. So are there any new advancements for inflammatory breast cancer? Um, I'm going to actually open this up to any of our uh, panelists, but maybe Dr. Mina, Dr. Bahadur could chime in for inflammatory. Dr. Mina, you, do you want to take it or? I can. Um... So, I mean, inflammatory breast cancer has been, unfortunately, one of those most uh, resistant diseases. Um, I, I think, I mean, we're still to this day trying to figure out more about inflammatory uh, breast cancer and trying to figure out actually the true biology behind it. What we have done, I think, I mean, there has not been a specific drug that's approved specifically for inflammatory breast cancer, but what we have learned recently that the biology of inflammatory is a little bit more different. So now we are better about early on, like if a patient presents with inflammatory breast cancer, about early on trying to give them the neoadjuvant, like usual types of therapy, but be ready to change that treatment as soon as we see there is no response. We have partnered with uh, MD Anderson Houston in a big uh, consortium that actually Dr. Bilar has been also leading that um, targets specifically those inflammatory breast cancer patients and tries to understand a little bit more about the biology of the disease. Immunotherapy has been introduced more specifically in those patients. We have been more aggressive about the actual local uh, treatment. And as I said, more clinical trials are actually being done here and in uh, combination with Houston, trying to target specifically those patients. Do we have any of those clinical trials right now or it's a work in progress? That's one of the questions as well. So it is actually a work in progress uh, as far as because we still go by the subtype. So with inflammatory breast cancer, although it is inflammatory and more aggressive, we still go by the specific subtype of the disease. So with inflammatory, so we have studies with inflammatory breast cancer that are triple negative. And that is where I would urge patients more to be on studies when they have inflammatory breast cancer that's triple negative, for example. Um, but we don't have anything that's kind of just dedicated to inflammatory breast cancer. We are actually working uh, actively on a, a project with Houston, but we don't have it open yet. And um, Dr. Rosso um, actually has research done in the realm of inflammatory breast cancer. So um, Dr. Rosso, from the surgical side, anything um, you'd like to share with the inflammatory breast cancer um, information? Absolutely. So inflammatory breast cancer, unlike um, other more early stage uh, breast cancers, is not, you can't treat it with breast conserving surgery. Um, Patients who have uh, inflammatory breast cancer, even if they respond to chemotherapy such that there's no evidence of disease any longer in their breast, uh, we still offer a modified radical mastectomy. That's standard. And uh, it's important to be aggressive, very uh, aggressive surgically with this type of disease. And then the patients go on to receive comprehensive chest wall and nodal post mastectomy radiation therapy, sometimes even twice a day for inflammatory breast cancer. And so with that being said, we we do not recommend reconstruction um, initially. Uh, we want the patients to be treated aggressively and have no delays in their care. Um, and it, after you know, six to 12 months following radiation therapy is usually when we talk about autologous reconstruction. Of radiation, it sounds like for inflammatory, it's needed a lot. We know that, but um, we have a question here 
uh, specifically about radiation. That I heard that radiation is different now than in the past. Um, can you talk about some of the changes in radiation? Um, Dr. Grade, would you like to address some of those questions? I, I would love to. I think the biggest thing, and I've been around a few decades now, that I've seen change over time is um, the amount of radiation therapy that we give is getting less and less, um, more, primarily because we're uh, learning from our colleagues from Canada and the United Kingdom who do things more efficiently than in the US. Um, and we see their uh, long uh, years of data come out showing, say, for example, six weeks of radiation, which was our more standard approach, um, now can be four weeks in, in most cases. Um, and lately we're um, working with Houston MD Anderson on some of their protocols, uh, doing one to two weeks of radiation therapy. So we're giving back the time to the patient and still getting the same results because we know radiation therapies every day it's very disruptive to the life of a patient who's a working person or has a family. And so to not have to come for an additional four weeks or two weeks, I mean, could make a huge difference in their life. And the results are, you know, finding, we want to give the same result, the same outcome. And uh, so we're doing this carefully over time, but it's definitely the biggest trend I've seen in my field. I think that's really exciting. I think, you know, even in my time, I've been in practice seven years now and have been doing breast even a little before that. Um, it was seven weeks. It was seven weeks of radiation or sometimes more. And it's really amazing to see it, you know, possibly coming down to, you know, the one to two weeks that you described. Um, these protocols I know are unique to MD Anderson in a lot of ways. So bringing it here is really exciting. We partnered uh, with um, Houston MD Anderson on two of their studies, and now a third one is going to be opening. And they're all focused on making it easier on the patient. Um, it's very you know, comforting to be a part of the big change uh, that benefits the patient. I agree. Um, so we've had actually multiple questions come in and maybe this speaks to the controversy about screening mammograms, but I'd like to call on Dr. Loving. So when should women start getting screening mammograms? This is something that comes up in the news frequently too. Yeah, this is a, a common controversial topic, unfortunately. Um, and, and it is very confusing. Um, and so I'll just start by saying at at Banner MD Anderson, and um, actually also in MD Anderson in, um, in Texas, uh, we follow the guidelines of what's called the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. Um, and, and that network is composed of uh, cancer experts from different specialties, so oncologists, surgeons, uh, breast radiologists. Um, and what that organization recommends is uh, yearly mammograms uh, every year, starting at age 40. Um, and then continuing again once a year. And um, there is no real upper age limit um, for when to stop. Although some people may say five to 10 year uh, uh, life expectancy, you should stop at that point. But that's obviously that's hard to predict what your life expectancy is. So we don't really specify what the upper limit is. Um, their confusion has arisen because other organizations uh, may recommend starting instead of at 40, um, starting at 50. Um, and then some may say to start or, or to get mammograms every other year instead of every year. Um, the, unfortunately, uh, there are differences in the outcomes for those recommendations. Um, the reason why we recommend 40 and every year is because the research um, strongly supports that that has the most benefit in terms of uh, saving lives from, from early detection. Uh, so basically decreasing death rates from breast cancer. Um, so for people that like numbers, um, the, the reduction of breast cancer and death with that 40 every year schedule is about 40%, um, so 40% um, compared to people, uh, for people who get skinny mammograms every year versus those who do not. Um, on the other hand, a schedule that is age 50 every other year, uh, the, uh, it is beneficial, but the reduction is much smaller, it's a little over 20%. Um, so it's about half the benefit. Um, in terms of um, life savings. Um, and and so, since our goal, of course, is to um, stop 
breast cancer death and basically cure as much breast cancer uh, people as we can, we, we choose to schedule that, that um, maximize that benefit. What about for, uh, let's say, a woman has a mother with breast cancer at 45, then, you know, do you change that? Would you recommend she start earlier? Yes, that's a great question. That comes up a lot. Um, that 40 in every year schedule, that pertains to someone with an average risk. Um, so basically someone with no family history that they know of, at least. Um, it becomes more complicated when people do have a family history or other risk factors that may elevate their risk over the average uh, woman. Um, and in order to know that, of course, women would have to have a risk assessment. So I, I do think it's important that women, typically what I recommend is at age 30, um, to have a discussion with their doctor about, hey, what is my risk level? Um, you can go online, actually, and there are various models um, that can help you to, to formulate or to determine whether you are at average or if you are at a higher risk level and uh, working with your doctor through those uh, models is helpful. Um, so pe for people such as the example you gave that have a strong family history, a mother age 45 or a sister at age 30, um, they would likely be considered at a high risk compared to the average. And so for high risk women, they may choose to supplement their screening with uh, a, a test such as a breast MRI exam every year. Um, and the reason being that uh, MRIs can uh, detect cancer at earlier stages, even in mammograms. Um, it, it's not so simple to say, well, all women should get MRIs, though, because MRIs do have a downside in that, one, they're expensive. Um, two, they can be uncomfortable for people. And uh, number three, they, they're so good at finding breast cancer that they also find uh, non-cancerous um, findings in the breast that, that many of which turn out to be insignificant or not, not important. Um, and so for the average woman, those downsides are probably not worth it to do that every year. But if someone is at a higher risk, then yes, it's probably worth it because you are at higher risk over the course of your life of developing breast cancer. So again, what, what I suggest is that all women should have that discussion with a doctor to determine where their risks fall. Um, and if they do fall at in a potentially in the high-risk category, then they should have those discussions about extra screening tests, but um, on top of mammograms. And it sounds like there's a lot of ways that a woman can um, kind of assess her risk a little bit online, but you know, at each of our clinics, our providers can offer risk assessments as well. I know in the Northwest Valley, downtown, our campus, we have multiple pro providers who can do that. Um, and then, uh, like I mentioned, I'll put a resource in on the resource page about our high-risk clinic who can help serve those patients who have that elevated risk. Um, so I think I have time for just one last question because it came up and it's in the line of the mammogram. Dr. Loving, dense breasts, anything uh, you want to share with our audience? They say, what is it? Why does it keep coming up on my mammogram report? Sure. So many people who, or actually all people now who have mammograms will be notified whether or not they have dense breasts. And that's due to actually it's a federal law um, now that all facilities that perform mammograms must notify women if they are uh, dense or not dense. Um, what that's referring to is the proportion of, uh, of what we, the, the, the medical term is fibroglandular tissue. It's basically, uh, to kind of simplify it, everyone's breast has two components. One is fat, um, which is not dense, and one is fibroglandular tissue, which is basically all the other stuff, everything else besides fat. Um, and some people have more of the other stuff, the dense stuff, and some people have proportionally more of the fat. And so people with dense breasts are the ones that have a lot of the dense breast tissue. Um, and on a mammogram, that dense breast tissue looks white. Um, and it's challenging there because people with dense breasts, um, that white normal but dense tissue can hide breast cancers uh, because breast cancers commonly on, on mammograms appear white. And so um, a common analogy is like a polar bear in a snowstorm. If you have a woman with dense breasts, just a lot of white, and the cancer is the polar bear, it's just going to be hard to see if there's a lot of snow around it. Um, and so that's what breast density is referring to. Um, so it's significant for that reason because it makes mammograms more difficult to interpret. Um, it's also significant because we know that dense breasts are a risk factor for breast cancer. Um, people that have dense breasts are at uh, a slightly higher risk of getting breast, can breast cancer compared to those who do not have dense breast tissue. Um, and um, again, mammograms are the way to find that out. It's genetic. I'm supporting that. So many people who mothers had it, they will have it too. 
Um, and so follow-up question, of course, is well, what does that mean for me? What do I do about that if I have dense breasts? Uh, it's, that is also um, dependent a lot on your risk level. Um, so for people that are, again, high risk, you, you, they qualify for MRI. MRIs can see through that dense breast tissue much better than mammograms can. Um, and people for average risk, the thing that I always recommend is looking for a facility that performs, uh, quote, unquote, 3D mammograms. 3D mammograms help to look through the breast tissue better than uh, conventional mammograms. Um, and so particularly for dense breast women, it's important to have that technology to help to help screen better for breast cancer. And it sounds like we have that technology at all of our facilities. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. Well, I, I want to uh, just wrap up here um, and don't worry everybody, your extra questions will be answered on our resource page in the FAQ portion there. But I just want to say what a great discussion we've had today and I really appreciate everybody participating and giving their time to us, especially our panelists. We're really excited to have this opportunity to interact with you today and, and we hope that you have enjoyed it. I know I have enjoyed um, sharing a little bit of information about our comprehensive breast program and just wanted to share that we are deeply committed to providing you, our patients, the most advanced uh, treatments, uh, diagnosis, prevention, support that we have available here. And so I'd just like to end with a little bit of gratitude. I want to thank all the donors to our program. Uh, truly, it's due to your generosity that we are able to put together programs like this that really advance the science and the research and the care for our patients. Uh, we really couldn't do it without you. Uh, thank you to Linda Lotz and the Banner Health Foundation for sponsoring today's discussion. Uh, we really do appreciate you uh, organizing this opportunity to shine a spotlight on our comprehensive breast program. And of course, thank you to our inspiring patients, to Jessica as well. We are truly honored by your trust in us. So thanks again to our panel. We hope everyone stays safe out there. Have a good evening. And again, watch for that follow-up email that's going to come your way shortly. We appreciate you joining us for our first ever virtual program at home together. Please send us your feedback, your future questions. And again, thank you. With gratitude. Have a good night. Thank you.